Thank you. So um, this is a really uh, ridiculously large crowd sitting on ridiculously uncomfortable pine wood. So you're all going to be squirming for like an hour because your ass is going to start to hurt. And it's not my fault. I didn't tell him to put you in here, you know. Uh, I can tell one of two things is true because of the size of this crowd. I don't know which it is. Maybe it's a combination. I don't know. It's either, number one, there is this just ridiculously intense interest in the subject of racial oppression at Sonoma State University. Or, yeah, right, yeah, sure, that's it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. Uh, sure. Or, uh, or possibly uh, extra credit still counts for a hell of a lot in higher education. And that's fine, that's fine, because it really doesn't matter uh, whether it's the first or the second or maybe a little bit of both for some of you. The, the truth is you're here and I'm here and it's going to look rude as hell for you to get up and leave before I'm done. So uh, for the most part, I have you, whether you like that or not. And uh, so let's hear it for compulsory attendance. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so here's the deal. I know that the subject matter that I'm going to be talking about this evening is not automatically the kind of subject matter that people naturally sort of gravitate to or ready to hear about, want to talk about, are comfortable talking about. I get all of that because I've been in that same place where I didn't always necessarily you know, want to talk about it either. So because I know it can be a difficult issue for some folks, uh, maybe for all of us to a degree, I'm going to start off this evening by sort of easing into the subject. Uh, by telling you a story that doesn't have anything at all to do with racism, doesn't have anything to do with racial privilege or oppression or discrimination or any of the heavy stuff that we will get into as the, as the time goes on. It's actually uh, a story that even though it doesn't have a specific link to that subject, however, I think when I'm done with it, you're going to realize how it is indirectly connected and how the story does say something indirectly about that subject even though that is not the topic of the story itself. It's a story about something that happened to me when I got out of college, which uh, is 20 years ago, actually, this spring. I graduated in May of 1990 from Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. And um, thank you for that. That's good. Um, you from there? Or you just like the city? Good. Excellent. Um, graduated 20 years ago this May from Tulane. And when I got out of school, I had this brilliant idea, at least I thought it was going to be brilliant. I'm not really sure why I thought this was going to be such a great idea, but I was convinced that the smartest thing I could possibly do after just graduating from college would be to move into a really large house with nine other people. I want to give you a little bit of life advice, okay? And if you don't remember another thing I say tonight, that would be a shame because I got more. But if you don't remember anything else, you need to write this down. You need to probably tweet this to yourself. You probably need to email yourself, bookmark this, put it on your forehead, something. This is the most important thing I'm going to say tonight, I guarantee it. And that is this. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking, you know what would be a damn good idea? Moving into a really big house with nine other people. <laughs> that is going to be a terrible idea. It is not going to be as cool and as fun and as hip and as interesting as you think it is going to be. It is, even if you try to make it political like we did by calling it a co-op. Right? It wasn't a co-op, it's just a big nasty house with 10 people living in it. Now we thought it was going to be a good idea and the only reason I think we probably were thinking that, in retrospect looking back, is that we knew we would save money, right? It would be cheap. And when you get out of college, you're going to be broke, you know, newsflash, and you're going to be looking for ways to save money, and we were, and so we thought this was a really good way to do it. Rent was $525 a month. I don't mean per person, I'm talking total, right? Even in 1990, that was really good, just in case you don't know. Like, that's still really good, even in 1990 dollars, $52.50 per person per month, man, you cannot beat that. Even when you added the utility bills, the cable bill, and the food bill, because we also split the grocery costs, right? Um, it was still less than 100 a month. So, I mean, that was a damn good deal on that level, right? But about six weeks into this little experiment in communal living, uh, I came to understand why this had been an absolutely horrible mistake. Why I would have been better off to live alone and just be broke. Why I would have been better off to just move home and live with my folks. Anything but this. And here's how I learned that I come home one night from work, I was working downtown in New Orleans doing anti-racism work in the city and around the state, 
and I come back uptown on the streetcar, get off the streetcar, walk the five blocks or so into the interior of the neighborhood where the house was. I walk into the house and I'm immediately greeted by this really incredible, and I mean it in a good way, a really incredible smell, which is not something you can often say when you live in a house with nine other people. This was an extraordinarily rare occurrence. This smell almost knocked me down. It was so good. It was the smell of dinner. And the dinner was, uh, on the front left burner of our stove, a big pot of gumbo that one of our roommates was making for the house, right? Because it's New Orleans and that's what you do, at least once a week. It was gumbo night. And man, it looked good and it smelled good. And it even had shrimp in there. Not many, like I told you, we were broke. But it had like three of those really little bitty ass shrimp. <laughs> the really little, tiny, the ones that make popcorn shrimp look like jumbo shrimp. The ones that make jumbo shrimp look like lobsters. You know the shrimp that I'm talking about. I don't even think it's shrimp. I think it's like shrimp dust or flakes or powder or something. Just enough to make you think you had seafood gumbo even though you really didn't. And when you're broke, you know, that'll sort of get you through. Make you feel like you got more money than you actually have. So it looked good and it smelled good. But when my roommate asked me if I wanted any, I actually had to turn him down because I'd already had dinner downtown. I didn't know he was going to make this incredible gumbo. So I said, you know, I'm going to have to pass. But... uh do me a favor, take it, save some for me, put it in the fridge, Tupperware, whatever. I'll take it to work tomorrow for lunch because it does look good. He said, cool, I'll do that. I said, great. So I go upstairs, hung out with some of the other roommates, did some work I was behind on, watched TV, something, listened to music, you know, passed a little bit of time and then went to bed sort of early. Woke up the next morning at about 7.15, 7.30, came downstairs to get some coffee and get ready for work. And I noticed that on the left front burner of the stove, still sitting there, is that pot of gumbo not looking as good as it had the night before, oddly. Not smelling nearly as good as it had the night before. And I was upset for two reasons. Number one, the food had gone to waste. No portion of it was saved or put away in the fridge like I asked him, right? So I was sort of upset about that. And secondly, he left the mess for me or one of the other roommates to clean up. So that wasn't very considerate either. I said, you know, this is sort of pissing me off, but I'll just deal with this later. You know, I'll, I'll talk to him about it this evening when I get home from work. For now, I'm just going to clean the thing, right? So I take the pot of gumbo and I bring it over to the sink and I get the, the brush and I get the, the soap and the, I put gloves on because I didn't want to touch it. It was nasty. It was really bad, you know? So I start to run the water and just before I let the water go into the pot of gumbo and start to clean it, I stop myself and I said, wait, wait. Wait, I, I don't have to clean this. I didn't make this mess. Hell, I didn't even eat any of this mess. This isn't my fault. I, I'm not the reason that this nastiness is in my kitchen. Now I felt really self-righteous, you know, because I talked myself out of doing the work. I felt really good about that. I took the pot of gumbo. I put it right back where I found it on the left front burner of the stove, went off to work. Came back that night about 20 after 6 or so, walked in the door, noticed that one of my other roommates was making dinner for the evening on the right front burner of the stove. But on the left front burner of the stove was still, now 24 and a half hours ripe, this same pot of gumbo just sitting there, sort of menacingly sitting there, stinking up the joint. I looked at my room and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to have to explain one thing to me. How is it that you can make dinner for us on the right front burner of the stove when I'm pretty confident you can, like, smell last night's dinner? Because it's right there under your left nostril. Would you please clean that? And he said, man, I wasn't here last night for dinner. It's not my fault. I, I didn't make this. I didn't eat any of this. He then looked at me very accusingly, pointed a finger and said, did you? Did you have any of the gumbo? I'm like, hell, man, not me. He's like, ah, neither did I. So now we both felt self-righteous. We both had talked ourselves out of cleaning up the mess. So I had some of his lentils and rice. I cleaned the plate. I put it in the dish drainer to dry, went upstairs, hung out with the roommates, did some work, listened to some music, went to bed sort of early, woke up the next morning, 7 a.m., I'd forgotten to set an alarm clock, but let me give you a little tip. Probably don't have to tell you this, but I'll tell you anyway. Right? If you're living in a house where a pot of gumbo has been sitting on the left front burner of your stove for what is now 36 and a half hours, you are not going to need an alarm clock to wake you up. <laughs> because the smell is going to crawl out of the pot of gumbo on the legs that it has grown and I am not speaking in metaphor, English majors. I mean that literally that the stench is going to grow legs and feet overnight. It is going to crawl up out of that pot across your kitchen, across your living room, go up the back stairs, down the back hall, under your door frame, and it is going to find with the precision of a laser that thing on the front of your face that you call a nose and you are going to be awake. And now I was, and I was pissed because I knew what the smell meant. I knew what was waiting for me. 
on the left front burner of that stove, having not been cleaned by anybody, least of all the guy that made the mess in the first place. So I swing open my door. I am angry. I run down the hall. I am angry. I live with nine other people. Cannot find one of them. And the guy that made the gumbo is like Osama bin Laden. Nobody knows where in the hell he might have gone. It's like, he, uh, it's like he made the gumbo as a practical joke just to see how long it would take for somebody else to clean it. And then he skipped down. So I get down to the bottom of the stairs, I look across the living room into the kitchen, I see the pot of gumbo, and I'm fairly confident even 20 years after the fact that the gumbo saw me. And it was at this moment, not one moment earlier, but I assure you, not even a half a moment later, that I came to understand and learn maybe the most important lesson I'd ever learned. And not just about gumbo and household cleanliness and the obvious, right, but about anything, about life in general. The lesson was that it didn't really matter anymore whether I was the one that had made the mess. Right? It didn't really matter anymore whether I was the, as the saying goes, the one, the author of all this unpleasantness. Right? The only thing that mattered in that moment was that I was tired of living in that funk. Right? That I was tired of living in that nastiness. That I was tired of living in the residue of somebody else's actions. Actions for which I was not to blame and in which I really was not implicated, but actions which were having a legacy, an after effect that was impacting my life just as much as it was everyone else's. You see, the same is true with human society. When we get tired of living in the funk, when we get tired of living with the residue of what other folks have done before we were even on the planet, things that they did that we have no control over, no involvement in, and that we are not guilty of having done, we will clean up the mess, not because we are guilty of having created it, but because we're the only ones left to do the job. You see, there's a profound difference at the linguistic and the philosophical level between the concepts of guilt and responsibility. Okay? Guilt is what you feel because of what you've done. Responsibility is what you take because of who you are. There is a very significant difference between those two things. And if we don't understand the difference, we best think about it, not just with regard to household cleanliness, but with regard to this subject that I'm here to talk to you about tonight. Because the legacy that we have inherited with regard to race and racial inequity is a profound and deep and troubled and tortured one. And we don't get to act like it doesn't affect us just because we're not to blame for having created it. We inherit it. Life is not like some video game where you get to hit reset, replay, start over just because you didn't like the way the game went down the first time. And back in third and fourth grade when they taught you in science class or whenever it was about the concept of inertia, right? The idea that an object in motion will continue in the same direction until it is stopped by a force of equal or greater weight pushing against it in the opposite direction. What they forgot to tell us, all of us, when we learned about that, is that inertia isn't just a property of the physical universe. It's a property of the socioeconomic and the cultural and the political universe. That which happens in one generation affects the next and the next and the next and it keeps on doing it until it's met with a force of equal or greater weight pushing against it. We are that weight or we are not. But make no mistake that unless that weight is brought to bear on the legacy of racial inequity that we have inherited like it or not, it will continue in the same direction as it always has. Now what is that legacy? Let's be clear about it because we're not. See, we're a country that doesn't believe in honest language. And we're a country that doesn't believe in honest history. And we're a country that doesn't believe in taking any accountability or responsibility for the past unless it makes us feel good. Oh, we love the past when it makes us feel good. That's what July 4th is, in case y'all hadn't figured that out. We love, that's what Independence Day, I mean, honest to God, like, that's about some old stuff, right? And I don't, th I don't think any of you are going to go to a July 4th parade. Everybody's waving their flag, Boy Scouts are marching, bands are playing, and you're not going to go up to the guy with the I love the USA hat and the big patriotic pin and say, um, this is really great and all, but um, tell me, when are you going to get over it and move on? And by that, I mean the whole breaking away from the British thing. Like, that happened a really long time ago. So might you, might you move on and get past it? You're not going to say that. And if you do, you're going to be laying on the ground. You're going to get knocked down. We love the past when it makes us feel good. We just don't want to deal with the less benign aspects of our heritage. But let's deal with it. The truth is, the legacy of race in this country is one that for 300 years, going back to the colonies of what would become the United States, from the mid-1600s, into the middle of the 1900s, so a three century period, was a society that was at every level, without exception, a formal system of white supremacy. 
Now, that's not the language that we use. That's not the wording that we use. That's not how we say it. We say instead, mistakes were made. We say instead, oh, we had some problems, but good people got together and they fixed those problems, and isn't that nice, and now we can move on. But that isn't honest language, and it prevents us from really understanding the impact of that history on our present day, and to that extent, if we don't deal with it, our future. A system-wide white supremacist culture in which every person who was able to be called white like I am in this country today, every single one of us was elevated above every single person who wasn't called white without a single solitary exception anywhere in the country. Not just the South where I'm from, not just the East Coast, but the West Coast, the Midwest, the Northwest, every part of the country in between. That's the legacy. Now, you might think, well, that's fine, but what's the impact of that today? We could spend literally semesters on what the impact is today, and I know there are faculty here who do that for those who take their classes. But I will just give you one example of how the legacy of that history continues to shape the present. Because it's not just a history class. It's not just something we need to know and sort of file away for a history exam. Right? This is now affecting us. What's the evidence? One piece alone that stands out to me is the simple fact that in 2010, right now as I speak, not 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years ago, but right now this evening, the average white family in this country, not the average rich white family, forget that, the average white family has 11 times the net worth of the average black family, eight times the net worth of the average Latino family. And it's not because we've worked harder. God knows that some of the hardest work ever done on this land that we now call the United States of America has been done by black and brown bodies. It's not because they, that we have prayed harder. It's not because we have a stronger work ethic. It's not because we have a better savings rate with the money that we earn. And God knows it is not because white folks have some superior investment knowledge that people of color lack. I mean, for God's sake, if we've learned nothing in the last 18 to 24 months of global economic meltdown, let us at least learn this. This lesson, a handful of rich white dudes are able to lose a hell of a lot of money without any help from black people, without any help from Mexicans, without any help from native peoples, without any help from people of color at all, and all of it before Barack Obama even walked into his new house. The last 18 months of the previous presidential administration, 20% of all the wealth in this country, wealth that had been accumulated over a two plus century period was wiped out. $12 trillion worth of American wealth destroyed because of the economic machinations of a handful of elite, almost exclusively white and overwhelmingly male bankers and other financiers and people moving money around instead of creating products because that's what our economy does now. We move money around for rich people. We sell derivatives. Do you even know what a derivative is? Don't worry if you don't. Neither did the people who were selling them. That's how we got in this mess. Right? Twelve trillion dollars in wealth wiped out by incompetence, by unethical, and often by criminal behavior of those derivatives traders, of real estate speculators, operators of a casino economy, moving money around, which is fine if it's in the basement of your frat house and you're playing for beer. It is not so fine when you are playing with the world's money and then when they don't have the capital to actually handle the bets that come in as losses, which is what has happened in our economy. You have trillions of dollars of global wealth wiped off the balance sheets of the world economy because of the actions, not even of all white men, just a handful of the most powerful in the, in the banks and in Wall Street and in places where elites speculate with other people's livelihoods, you see. But what's interesting is we are still more afraid of the average black or brown young man crossing the street wearing a hoodie than we are of rich white men driving around in Lexuses, or maybe it's Lexi, I don't know the proper plural form. Perhaps a grammarian in the room will explain it to me, but the point is we're still more afraid of the usual suspects, even though it would take half a millennium, I'm talking 500 years for black and brown street thugs to steal as much damn money as this handful of rich white men just wiped off the global balance sheets in a year and a half. They would have to rob you around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never taking a break to eat, sleep, or piss to steal as much money. Hand in the pocket, hand in the pocket. My hand is still in your pocket, still in your pocket. And 500 years later, they wouldn't have as much money. And yet we're still more afraid of them, even though they can't do nearly as much damage given half a millennia to do so as a very small handful of elites at the top of the power pyramid were able to do to us in two years. 
The reason I make that side note about the economic meltdown is that it suggests that the reason for those wealth gaps between whites and blacks, whites and Latinos, can't be about merit, can't be about intelligence. Hell, these were the brightest people on the block. These were the most brilliant students in their business school. These were brilliant bankers who understood the workings of the free market so damn well that they almost destroyed it. So in fact, it isn't about intelligence or know-how or work ethic. Why is there an 11 to 1 white to black wealth gap, 8 to 1 white to Latino? Very simply, one overriding reason, and it's a reason we don't like to talk about in this country, but we damn well better, and that is that the United States government has regularly and consistently intervened on behalf of white America to create that wealth and to subsidize the creation and the protection and the production of that wealth. Now, we really don't like to hear that. Oh, no, we don't like to hear that. And those of us who are white, we get downright pissed when people suggest, well, what are you talking about? Oh, my family got everything they got from hard work. Nobody ever gave us anything. We never got anything from government. That's those other people that rely on. We, 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 are, we are rugged individualists. We carved a civilization out of the wilderness. <laughs> Putting aside the inherent racism of that narrative, right? We did all on our own. Well, let's break that down for a second. Let's break that down for a second. Because there's an awful lot that you didn't learn about in history class. Not your fault that you don't know it if you don't. A lot that you didn't learn about in the media. Not your fault if you didn't learn it. How would you? How would you have known that the United States government gave out 240 million acres of essentially free land to white people under the Homestead Act if nobody ever talked about it? But that's what happened in the 1860s. Most of that land west of the Mississippi. Guess where y'all living at? 240 million plus acres of land given out to white families for virtually nothing just because they were white. This was land that had to be taken first, either from indigenous people or from Mexico in a war of aggression that we most definitely started on false pretense. Had to be taken from some so as to be redistributed to white folks. Now, the free market, in case y'all don't know, can't pull that off on its own. Capitalism, the free market can't take land from others and give it to you. Only a really big government with guns is capable of doing that. 240 million plus acres of land. And I haven't seen any of those white folks' descendants. There are 20 million to 50 million of them today in this country. Walking around, the direct descendants and beneficiaries of that land giveaway. Either they inherited the house, they inherited the farm, they inherited the ranch, they inherited the acreage, and they still are on it, or they inherited it somewhere down the line and sold it and made money from it. 20 to 50 million people in that category, I haven't seen one of them go to Washington and say, you know, I'm feeling really bad about this. And I think I'd like to give the house back. <laughs> because if I were to keep it, seeing as how it's like a government handout, that would almost be like I was implicated in, what's the word I'm looking for? What's that? Socialism. And God knows I wouldn't want to do that. So here, please take the farm back. No, hell no, nobody's doing that. Right? We don't want to talk about the fact that in the 20th century, forget the 1800s, let's bring it up to the more modern era, within the lifetimes of some of the people in this room, and if not you in the room, certainly your parents or grandparents, from the 1930s to the 1960s, a 30-year period from about 34 to 62, 28 years, whatever. Right? The government of the United States, through two housing programs, the Federal Housing Administration Home Loan Program and the Veterans Administration Home Loan Program, gave out over 100, or guaranteed and underwrote and subsidized, in effect, $120 billion worth of housing equity, and almost all of it for white families, because people of color, even though their taxes were also going to help underwrite some of those loans and guarantee them, were unable to get in on that government intervention. Even if you were a black or brown veteran, you couldn't get a VA loan for housing in almost any instance because of the way that the banks and the government combined were using an underwriting criteria that basically excluded all people of color. Forty percent of all the mortgages that white families were getting by 1960 were written under these preferential policies. Now, what do you think we would call it if we gave out 240 million acres and 140 billion dollars worth of other housing property to black people in this country? We would call that welfare. We would call that affirmative action. We would call that racial preference. We would call that maybe even reparations. We would think it was horrible and unjust. We did that exact same thing for white folks. And we called it nation building. And we called it macroeconomic policy. Right? But the truth is you have millions of people who were excluded through no fault of their own. And then, of course, once those white folks got in on that housing, that wouldn't have existed but for government intervention in the working of the market, and particularly the housing market. The white middle class wouldn't have existed. There was no such thing before the government came along and created it by virtue of those policies. 
That doesn't take away from the hard work of white folks who got those loans. Not that at all. It's to say that if they got them and others couldn't, that that was a preference, that that was a form of a handout, and that that now plays a role in the wealth gaps that we see. 11 to 1, white to black. 8 to 1, white to Latino. This is why it's very interesting for me to hear these folks at the Tea Party rallies running around saying, we just want to go back to the days of small government. The hell days were those? Because for white folks, government has never been small. That's the point. Government was never small for white folks. You can't be small and give out 240 million acres of land. Man, that's a big ass program. You can't be a small government and underwrite $120 billion worth of housing equity. That too is a big ass program. That's not small government. So what do they really mean? We want to go back to the days when government was just doing stuff for us. That's what they mean. You don't believe me? Why is it that, think about this now, in 1935 when the Social Security Act was passed and cash welfare payments to single moms were created, it was called, at that time it was called aid to dependent children. It's gone through a couple different permutations since. Nowadays, we tend to associate that because politicians have made damn sure that we do by virtue of the way they use this issue. We tend to associate cash welfare programs with women of color. What's interesting is, when the program was created in 1935, it was actually one that excluded almost all women of color, and it was specifically created to allow white widows and white women whose husbands had left them to stay at home with their kids and not have to go to work in the paid labor force. In other words, the program's purpose, its intent was to allow white women to not have to go to work outside the home. Nobody ever said, ooh, it's going to make these white women lazy. Ooh, it's going to make them dependent on the government. But as soon as black and brown women, 25 years later, begin to gain access to those programs that white women had already had access to, all of a sudden, we discover the problem of welfare dependency. My goodness, this is making these black and brown women lazy, and, and they just don't go to work, and we've got to get them outside the home. We wanted the white women to stay home with their kids, but the black and brown women, no, get the hell out. Go get a job. See how the rhetoric changed as soon as the folks of color gained access to the program. White folks didn't have a problem with those programs by and large when only we were benefiting. So when folks say, I want my country back, know that that is what they mean. Can't be the days of small government because for people like most of them, there never was those days of small government. It can't be low taxes. Hell, the top marginal tax rate in 1957 was 91%. That's more than double what it is now. So some of those good old days they want to go back to before the, the, big, the big social spending liberal 60s, the top tax rate was more than double then in the 50s what it is right now. So what are they talking about? See, I would say they're not talking about the size of government. They're not talking about tax rates. They're talking about white racial resentment, about the fact that the society's changed. It's not the one that their grandparents grew up in. And they feel entitled to maintain that society. You don't believe that's what it's about? You think that's unfair? Let me give you two examples that I think prove it. If it were just about the size of government and all that, and look, there are perfectly valid non-racial reasons that if you want to be a libertarian and you, you want to be against the policies of the Obama administration, that, that's, that's fine. That doesn't automatically mean you have racial motivation. But I want you to understand, when you have people like Glenn Beck going around and on his own television show last July, getting up and saying in the midst of the health care debate what it is that he said during that time, makes it very hard for me to believe it's not about race. What did he say? He gets up on his show and it's fascinating, right? He says, you know what this is about? I'm going to tell you what this is about. And of course, his loyal listeners are like, tell me, tell me. I'm going to tell you, it's not about health care. Barack Obama doesn't care about your health. No, of course not. That would be crazy. Because um, he's a Manchurian candidate anyways. Whole purpose is to kill us all, right? Of course. It's not about health care. You know what this is about? This is all about reparations for black people. That's what Glenn Beck, best-selling author, respected by some radio and television talk show host, said. It's just about reparations for slavery. Now think about this with me for a second, because I remember when I watched it, I was like, what the hell, even for him, that makes no damn sense. That's the craziest thing I've heard since the last time I watched his show. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Intellectually, it makes no sense, right? Because honestly, like, what kind of reparations is it that you've got to get sick first to get paid? <laughs> what, 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 what is that? Like that, in order to believe that, you have to think black people are sitting around going, oh, I got a plan. I've got a plan how to get my 40 acres and a mule. Do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear it? Yeah, I want to hear it. What's your plan? Here it is. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. Here it is. Cancer. Isn't that brilliant? No, no, not so brilliant. No. 
So it doesn't make any sense intellectually, right, to say that it's about reparations. But now think about why would you say it then if it doesn't make any sense, if it's so obviously ridiculous. Why do you say it? Well, it's a very good thing politically, isn't it? Because politically, if you're trying to get white folks to think they're coming for your money, this black man in the White House, he's coming for your money and he's going to take it, he's going to give it to those people, then it becomes a perfectly valid message if that's your goal. So politically, it's brilliant. Intellectually, it's bankrupt of any value. But politically, it's a good way to stir up white racial resentment. Thus the purpose. Rush Limbaugh, two months later, decides to take the train one stop further to Crazy Town, right? Glenn Beck stopped at the second or third stop. Limbaugh's like, no, I'm going to go all the damn way to Crazy Town. So he gets on his show and he does an even better example of this white racial resentment thing, right? Just to give you this indication of how this, this history comes into the present. So Limbaugh decides to make an issue of a very interesting but yet very small and pretty minor news story out of Belleville, Illinois. Little bitty play. I mean, not a big town, really, you know? And uh, there's a fight on a school bus. Whew. Shouldn't even be news in Belleville, let alone national news. Fight on a school bus. Two black kids beat up a white kid. Now, it's a horrible thing. Obviously, the kids deserve to be punished for it, and they were. But when it was investigated, and it was, both by school officials and by cops, they determined there was absolutely no racial component to this fight. The black kids did not do it because the kid was white. There was no racial hostility between the black kids and the white kid. It just so happened that the two kids who did the beating were black and the kid that got beat was a white kid. But no racial component other than that, just the fact of who was who. But Rush Limbaugh didn't care about facts. He gets paid lots of money to not care about facts. So he gets on the air the next day, even after the report has been released, it says race is not involved in this at all. And he says, direct quote, welcome to Obama's America, where white kids get beat up on the bus while the black kids cheer. Now I want you to think about that. Why would you say that? Once again, intellectually, it's crazy as hell. Right? It's like, it, it, in order to believe that that makes any sense, you'd have to think, like, what he's saying is that Obama's to blame for this. Like, somehow Barack Obama, like, text messaged these black kids. <laughs> like, he's sitting in a really important meeting in the White House, and he's like, wait, hold on just one sec. <laughs> hold on. Okay, you see that white kid right there, two, two rows up? You see him? You see him? Beat his ass! Oh, wait, hold on. Michelle also says, beat his ass. I mean, that's just crazy. Nobody in their right mind could believe that. And yet, once again, politically, it's a brilliant line. Because if you say that now, it's not just about, he's coming to take your money, white people. No, no, he's coming to take your children. He's coming to hurt your kids. You see, once again, you can push that button of racial resentment not because it makes any sense intellectually or analytically or factually, but because you're not dealing with intellect there, you're dealing with the emotional, you're dealing with the internalized biases and the fears, the legacy of a history of racism in the country. So that is what I find fascinating about this current moment and our inability to talk about it honestly renders us unable to move forward. You cannot move forward when you're unwilling to confront that which, lays which lies behind you. That's true not just with regard to race, it's true with regard to anything in your own life, right? If you want to be a productive, healthy person, but you've got a bunch of stuff in your life from your childhood that you haven't dealt with, just wait, stick around, and it'll come back and it will get you on an individual level. If you haven't already learned that, you will learn that soon enough, right? All of us have got this baggage that we bring in, and as a country, we've got this really huge baggage that nobody wants to talk about, or they are willing to talk about it, but now they just want to say, well, that, that was then and this is now, and, and now it's all been wiped clean because of the election of Barack Obama. So as of the 5th of November 2008, the day after the election, all of that's gone now, but none of that's gone. None of what I just said changed. That 11 to 1 wealth gap is right now. Barack Obama's been president, been in the actual office for over a year. That wealth gap hasn't changed. Labor Department data that comes out last December says what? that black folks with college degrees twice as likely to be unemployed as white folks with college degrees. Latinos with college degrees two-thirds more likely than white folks with college degrees to be unemployed. Asian Americans with college degrees 15 percent more likely than white folks with college degrees to be out of work. So same educational background, same basic credentials, and yet not the same level of payoff 
for people of color who have done all the right things, played by the rules, went to school, got their degree, did everything they were supposed to do, and still having a much harder time finding work. Now, this is a very important piece of data because it suggests two things. Number one, that there are some kind of barriers still out there with regard to folks of color, even when they've done everything right and have significant qualifications. It also suggests that this idea of widespread reverse discrimination is a myth, maybe a fantasy, maybe just an outright fraud, because if that were the case, I mean, if people of color were getting all the goodies at the expense of white people, then that data would say the opposite. They'd be snapping up every black person with a degree. They'd be like, damn, another black person, another Latino, that's fantastic. What, a white person with a college degree? Hell no, we don't want any of them. But that's not what they're doing. A study from 2004 found that job applicants with white names, they don't even know for sure that you're white. They just think you might be based on your name. And you have a 50% better chance of getting called back for an interview than applicants with black sounding names, even when all the qualifications are the same, same years of experience, same education, same quality of education, same major, everything indistinguishable except the names at the top. Again, suggesting ongoing obstacles. Now, what's interesting is that study comes out in 04 from MIT and the University of Chicago's econ departments, neither of which, by the way, are known for being liberal or leftist departments. If you don't know that, you should. These are not leftists trying to find evidence of racism under every nook, right? Because, indeed, these are very conservative departments. But they found the evidence anyway. Comes out in 2004, which is interesting because that's the same year that for most of us we became familiar with Barack Obama. At that time he was a state senator. He would win the U.S. Senate election later that fall. But at that time he was in the state Senate. We learned of him, most of us, because he was the keynote speaker at the Democratic Convention in Boston that year. That was the first time that he really had given a national speech. It's the first time that most of us had ever heard of the guy, let alone seen him. So he gets up and he gives this talk, right? This, this really rhetorically beautiful keynote address. And the biggest applause line in the speech is where he says, there is not a black America and a white America and a Latino America and an Asian America. There's just the United States of America. Right? And everybody gets all woozy and they're like, oh, God. Wow, it's beautiful. Wow. So beautiful. Right? People are falling out, you know. It was a beautiful line. I mean, it was rhetorically, it was quite brilliant. But a man as smart as he, and even those who don't like him much, are usually pretty quick to give him uh, his, his deserved uh, recognition for his intelligence. A man as smart as he surely must have known that what he said when he said that bore no resemblance to reality whatsoever. The idea that we weren't a divided nation, that we were just the United States of America. Now maybe you think, well, he was saying it as an aspirational goal, but he didn't say it aspirationally. He said it descriptively. He didn't say this is what we want to be and what we're working toward. He said this is who we are, untrue. You can't just pronounce unity, particularly in the face of the evidence that says what it says about the job discrimination or the wealth disparities or the housing disparities, two to three million cases of housing discrimination each year against people of color in this country right now, not 30 years ago, right now. That's going on at the time. So you can't just say unity and, and have it be an act of wish fulfillment. It's not like that movie with Kevin Costner where he builds the baseball stadium in the backyard and all the old dead white dudes come back. And then that voice says, if you build it, they will come. That works for Hollywood. That is not how justice happens. You don't just say, I'm going to build it. I'm just going to make it. I'm just going to dream it. And it'll happen. You have to actually do the work. So when he made the comment, even though it wasn't true, got people swooning. That tells you how not post-racial we are. The fact that he had to say that. Because you do know he had to say it. Right? If he doesn't, if he alludes to the data on white name applicants and black name applicants, if he talks about the housing discrimination, if he mentions the Justice Department study that came out that very summer, which said what? That black and Latino males are two to three times more likely than white males to have their cars stopped and searched, even though white males are four times more likely to actually be caught with drugs on us on the occasions when we're searched. So we're searched half as often or one third as often, but we're four times more likely to have the stuff on us. If he mentions that, what's going to happen? He's going to be accused of pandering to special interest, playing a race card, right? Just if you learn nothing else, aside from the gumbo thing that I talked about before and the whole don't live with 10 people thing, here's the next thing you need to know. Race is not a damn card, okay? And if it is, it's like the two of diamonds, which is to say it doesn't win any hand that you're playing. 
I mean, it's like a really weak-ass card. So to think that anybody would play that just for fun, like black and white folks are having an argument, and white folks are winning, and black folks are like, damn, what am I going to do? What am I going to... Aha! The race card! And then white folks are like, oh! Damn. I had you. And then you played that, and now I'm, I'm helpless. I'm, I will give you anything you want. Right? That doesn't happen. So the idea that people of color just go around making it up, like that's going to get them somewhere, right? If anything, it just gets them looked at like they are, you know, late to get to the psych ward. That's what people look at when folks of color talk about racism. They look at it like they're crazy. Nobody's going to do that on purpose, bring that kind of criticism on themselves for fun, because they got nothing better to do, right? But that's Barack Obama had to, had to proclaim unity, couldn't talk about any of this stuff. He, you know, all this stuff I've said tonight, beyond the part where I was like, hey, thanks for coming, Barack Obama couldn't say any of it. Not even the parts that are inarguable. Like, you can have disagreements with some of the stuff I'm saying, or the analysis that I'm putting on the data that I'm using, but there's some stuff that really isn't arguable. Like the fact that we were a system of formal white supremacy for 300 years. I mean, that's not even, there is no opposite side, there's no rebuttal, okay? There just isn't. Like, you cannot argue that point. It is not debatable. But Barack Obama couldn't have gotten up and said that. I mean, if, if candidate Obama says, you know, we were a system of formal white supremacy, um, he's not gonna be president. He's not even going to be a U.S. senator, right? I don't know what he'll be, but you won't know who he is because that would have ended his... He can't talk about that, right? Which goes to show you how not post-racial we are. Because, and for that matter, let's just break it down even more. The people of color in this room aren't allowed to get away with saying what I've been saying either, right? Not because they don't know it. Oh, they know it fairly well. They have talked about it all of their lives in many cases. Talk about it every bit as well as I can, right? Probably better. But the fact is, if they say it, it's so easy to ignore, you know, because that's been our history, is ignoring this problem. Now, we need to understand that that denial isn't something that's just new. If it was, we'd almost understand it, because you can see certain manifestations of progress. I'm not saying there's been none. That would be insane for me to say that. It'd be disrespectful to the people who fought, and many of whom have died, to get us to the point we're at today. So there's been progress, but here's the thing. It isn't just in the modern era that we deny the problem. It's actually an intergenerational phenomenon, which goes to show just what of a problem we have in this country, that we have never really seen the problem for what it is. And when I say we, I mean white folks by and large. Most people of color have been pretty clear on it. Some have not. There have always been folks of color in denial about racism, just like there are women in denial about sexism. It happens. But for the most part, denial is a dominant group thing. Now, here's the thing. If you were to go back to the early 60s, and if I were to ask you, do you think that people of color had equal opportunity in 1963 or 1962. I mean, you're going to say no. It doesn't matter what your politics are. It doesn't matter what you think about racism in 2010. Every one of us in here knows that in the early 60s, things were unequal. That was before the Civil Rights Act. It was before the Voting Rights Act. It was before the Fair Housing Act. So we all know that now. And in retrospect, it's easy to say 47, 48 years later. It doesn't take any courage to say it, right? It doesn't take any real intelligence to say it. It's just common sense. But here's what's interesting. If you go back to the early 60s, when the past wasn't the past, when the past was the present, and you look at what white folks said when the Gallup organization polled them and asked white folks in 1963, do you think that blacks are treated equally in your community, in housing, education, and employment? Again, in retrospect, we know the answer is no, that they were not treated equally. But in 1963, when white folks were asked that question, even when it was obvious now, how unequal it was, two out of three white folks said, yeah, they're treated fully equally. Nothing to see here. Racism, what are you talking, what, what do you mean? What's the matter? Nothing wrong. Keeping in mind, 1963 is the year of the March on Washington, right? So like 200,000 people go to Washington and march, and two out of three white folks are like, what the hell is that about? Like, I, I don't even understand why are they doing that? I, I have a dream. What, why are you dreaming? What, what's wrong? Everything's cool. Like, dream? Everything's fine. Right? That's what two out of three white folks, by our own admission, were saying at the time. I'm not trying to be cruel. I get, I get accused of that. People are like, oh, he hates white people. Let me just be clear about this, because I don't want to be misunderstood. I actually love me some white people. Okay? <laughs> actually, seriously, love me some white people. My, um, my wife is white. I love her. <laughs> um, our two little girls. They're white, which is often what happens when two white people have babies. Uh, I love them. They're great. Uh, 
Actually, I don't get along with my dad, but it's not because he's white. It's like for some other stuff, right? So it isn't about white people. It's about whiteness. I think that's a very important thing for us to understand. Whiteness is something that's been done to us, to all of us. Whiteness is something that was put on us, those of us from European descent. We weren't even called that until a few hundred years ago, and the reason they started calling us that was so that we wouldn't realize we had a lot more in common with most black and brown folks than we did rich people, because most of us weren't rich. Our families weren't. Most European people were working class, lower income, oftentimes poor, many of them indentured servants. But how do you get those indentured servants to think that you're on their side and that they're on your team and keep them away from those black folks who want to overthrow the system? Well, you tell them, oh, you're on our team. You're, you're part of us. You're part of our posse. You're part of the white race now. Oh, great. Doesn't get you any land, doesn't get you a good job, you still don't have crap, but you have the ability to say, well, at least I'm not like them, you know, at least I'm better. So when I'm talking about whiteness, I'm not trying to criticize or be cruel to any white person. I'm talking about a mindset, a mentality that allows for that denial. In 1962, it was even worse. Gallup asked white folks, do you think black children have equal schooling in your community? I mean, we know in retrospect, the answer is no. But in 1962, 87% of whites said yes. Almost 9 out of 10 white people said, sure, schools are perfectly equal. Now think about that. What, how, how, what is the rationale for that level of delusion? How can people be so wrong? There are only two possible explanations. One is that white folks are just so mean, horrible, cruel, nasty, evil, and cold-hearted that we just don't care. Well, I mean, are there some people like that? Of course, in every group, every race, every ethnicity. But it's ridiculous to think that that would explain nine out of 10 white people being in denial, just being cruel people. That just doesn't even make sense. We know that's not right. So what's the other option? There's only one other possible one. And that is that in 1963 and in 1962, and I would say even in 2010, to be white means I don't have to know any better. To be white means I don't have to know what people of color experience in my country that we share, in the city that we share, on the campus that we share, in the classrooms that we share. I don't have to know what people of color are experiencing in terms of racism because if I don't know, what happens to me? Nothing. There's no punishment. It's not going to be on the test. And by that, I mean whatever test you got to take to get into college, to get out of college, to get into med school, grad school, law school, professional certification, in any career that you choose, you will never have to demonstrate that you know the first thing about the experiences of people of color. But now, if people of color don't know what white folks think is important, all hell breaks loose. Because that will be on the test. In fact, that will be the test. So people of color will have to learn white literature, white theater, white poetry, white art. I know we don't call it that. That's sort of the point. When your stuff is the norm, when your stuff is considered normative and normal and everybody else's stuff is compared to it, and usually found to be inferior by comparison, you don't have to racially designate where it came from. You don't have to call it white literature. You can just get away with calling it literature, theater, poetry, art. This just, and let's just clear this up because like, 10 months from now, or whatever it is, uh, February is going to come back. So we just need to clear this up before February. This is the reason we don't have White History Month, y'all. Because we have several of them. They just so happen to go by these tricky names that we've given them as a purpose of camouflage. Names like May and June and July and August and every other month, you see. But when you're the dominant group, you don't have to think about that. And it's not just race. Look, when you're the dominant group of any type, you have the luxury of being oblivious to other people's reality. And if you don't have to know something, the odds are you won't know it. Which is why it's so important to get used to listening to what targeted groups have to say, not just about race. Men, we don't have to know what women go through, do we? We really don't have to. I have two little girls and a wife I love dearly, but I don't have to know what they experience in terms of sexism. If I do know, it's probably because a woman told me and I chose to believe her instead of assuming that she was overwrought, over-emotional, or, God forbid, hormonal. Because you do know, apparently, in the eyes of some men, like, only women have hormones, apparently. You know, just so you know, like, testosterone, no, it does nothing to us, but estrogen will drive you to the brink of insanity if you're a woman. To hear some of us tell it. So if, if I know what women experience in terms of sexism, it's because I've chosen to listen or maybe been trained by folks like my mama to learn to listen, 
right? Same thing, straight folks, we don't have to know what LGBT folks experience in terms of marginalization or discrimination. We don't have to. If we do, it's probably because someone in our life who we know, who's lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans, has told us. And we have chosen to believe that they might actually know their life better than we do. Imagine, imagine, imagine that. Horribly radical concept that someone might know their life better than I know their life. Or even the most basic example of all, this would be one everybody can get their head around and it's very important that even if you have disagreements with some of what I have to say, there's some stuff we all need to at least have some common understanding of. Think about this, I don't even know how I got into this building tonight, y'all. Not because I have a particularly bad short-term memory, I mean I do have those two little kids and they do suck most of the energy and the brain matter out of my brain, but nonetheless, it's not why I have bad short-term memory, the fact is, that the reason I don't know how I got in here is because I didn't have to pay attention to it. Why? Because I'm able-bodied, at least temporarily. And I say temporarily because if we live long enough, most all of us at some point will experience at least a, if not several, forms of disability or infirmity. But as a temporarily able-bodied person, I don't have to worry like, is there a ramp? Are there steps? How long is it going to get to take, uh, take to get from the car to the, to the gym? How long is it going to take to get from the hotel to the car? All of those things, which if I were a person with a disability, I would have to think about those things. I would have to plan my day very differently. I would have to actually be cognizant of all the barriers, the obstacles, the various forms of discrimination or just, or just simply burdens that I would have to deal with that a member of a dominant group known as able-bodied doesn't have to. And the fact that I don't have to think about it and the fact that I don't think about it doesn't make me a bad person, right? It doesn't make me intentionally oppressive to the disabled, right? It just means that I've got one less thing to think about. I have one less thing to sweat and in a hyper-competitive society like ours, that's a big deal. That's privilege, that's an advantage, that's an edge. It's true in race, it's true in gender, it's true in class, it's true in sexuality, it's true in religion, it's true in physical ability slash disability, all of those things. The lesson I guess I'm hoping you'll get from this is that if we wanna understand if a problem like racism is still a real problem, we need to listen to those who were the targets of it because they're the ones who were in the best position to know, not us, not us. And we avoid acknowledging this, not only as a systemic reality, but an individual personal one. This is the last section of the talk, and then we're going to be out of here, I promise, because I know we got started late. But this is important, because see, if all you do is go away with the data and the analysis and the studies, that's really good come test time. You know, the time when you've got to demonstrate some intellectual knowledge that you took away. But, but there's something, if you're really going to get more out of it than that, you have to understand the personal affective aspect of this, right? The reality is whether we want to own it and acknowledge it or not, and of course we don't, we have all been conditioned and have internalized certain racist thoughts and thinking, and for that matter, sexist thoughts and thinking, classist thoughts and thinking, because we're subjected to that stuff all the time. Advertising works. Right? That's why companies spend billions to sell you products. And if they can make you think that you have to have a particular type of toilet paper after just 11 or 12 times seeing a commercial. Imagine how much easier it is if you have years of conditioning around race and class and gender and sexuality to internalize racial stereotypes, gender stereotypes, class stereotypes. I mean, hell, 12 commercials and you think you have to have Charmin. Literally, there's a thing in advertising called the rule of 12. Sometimes people have a rule of 11 maybe, but the idea is the first 10 times you see an ad, it doesn't have an effect. The 11th time, it's like a, some kind of crazy, magical, all of a sudden you're like, must have Charmin, must have Charmin, cannot use Angel Soft, cannot use Cottonelle, cannot use Bounty or Northern or whatever the hell, Bounty is like a paper towel, hell, you wouldn't want to wipe your ass with that, but you know what I mean, must have must have Charmin or I'll chafe all week, must have that. If that works with a product, right? If that works with a product, imagine when you're subjected to racial imagery and, and sexist Im racist imagery, sexist imagery, classist imagery, the idea that we escape that nonsense. There have actually been studies that prove it. They've taken white folks, hooked us up to MRI machines, scanning our brains, right? And then shown computer images of black male faces for 30 milliseconds, that's not enough time for your brain to even register that it saw anything, let alone what it saw. And yet when the MRI is hooked up and you see the image, subliminal image, you can't consciously register it, but the part of the brain that lights up on the scan is the part that responds to fear and anxiety and perceived threat. And when they show other images of white men or dogs or other animals or whatever, that doesn't happen. 95% of whites respond that way in those tests. 
Other tests have found that between 75 and 85 percent of us who are white have internalized racial bias against blacks and in favor of whites. And you know what's really sick? A third of black folks have done the same thing. A third of African-American folks have internalized anti-black, pro-white biases themselves because they get hit with the same stuff and then they internalize it. Latinos have internalized it. Asian folks have internalized it. That is what the research says happens to all of us. Now, we can either own that and try to grapple with what it means and try to fix that in terms of our behavior, or we can act like it's not there and ignore the way that we're being conditioned and moved around the chessboard, not even realizing it's happening. The good news is the research says if we are willing to own it, if we are willing to acknowledge that, yes, we've been conditioned, and yes, we have internalized certain prejudicial and stereotypical thoughts, then we can train ourselves not to act on those thoughts. We can challenge ourselves to do better than that, to respond to the better angels of our nature. The problem is most of us don't want to acknowledge it in the first place. And if we don't acknowledge it, you can't challenge it. You can't fight a problem that you're not willing to point to and to name and to admit is yours. We're so caught up in this idea that we're good people that we don't understand that good people can be involved in doing all kinds of really not so good things and that this is part of our conditioning. Let me tell you how deep the conditioning runs so you'll know what I mean and understand the importance of at least spending some of your time thinking about this. Doesn't have to be your passion in life, doesn't have to be the thing you do for a career or whatever, but just to think about it in your own life. You see, every now and then you think you know everything about a subject and then you learn something new. I learn something new every day about this topic. Three years ago, I'm sitting at home on a Sunday afternoon with our two girls and with my wife. It's raining like crazy outside, can't go to the park. We played every game in the house, nothing to do, getting restless, decide we're gonna watch a movie. So we're flipping around, we're gonna order a movie on the Comcast cable satellite deal, 495, whatever it is, and watch a film. So we're flipping around, looking at trailers, looking at commercials, see if there's anything for families. We come across the trailer for Evan Almighty, right? Fairly cute film, right? Steve Carell plays a senator or whatever, who's told by God, who's played by Morgan Freeman, that a flood is coming and he should build a really big boat and ride it out. You probably heard this story before in a different context. It is the Noah and the Ark story and it's just sort of updated, right? So it's cute, it's funny. But as it turned out, my, my kids and my wife had already seen it uh, five months earlier when it was still at the theater, so they didn't really want to watch it again. But because they recognized the dialogue and because the kids recognized the actors and, and the scenery in the commercial for it, in the trailer, it did get their attention. They looked up and Rachel, the younger of the two, who at that point wasn't even four years old yet, almost four, but not quite, looks up and she sees Morgan Freeman in the role of God with the flowing white robes. And she looks at me and she says, Daddy, and it's exactly what a four-year-old would say. She says, Daddy, is that really God? Because that's exactly what you would do. You don't know anything about the Screen Actors Guild at four. You don't know anything about casting directors at four, you know. You just figure God didn't have anything better to do, so he made a damn movie. I mean, if you're God, you can get that done. Right? So it was a cute question. I thought it was funny. I giggled, right? I looked at her. I said, no, no, honey, that, that, that's just Morgan Freeman. He's an actor. He, he plays God uh, often. Um, but um, <laughs> but he's, he's just an actor, actually. And uh, I thought that was the end of the conversation. But I was wrong. Because then Ashton, the older of the two girls, who at that point was not quite six, and who just based on chronology, she'd been on the earth longer. I've had more time to talk to her about issues of race and had done so quite often. She looks up, she sees Morgan Freeman in the role of God in the flowing white robes. She looks at her sister, she laughs and she says, Rachel, that can't be God. Now in that moment, I knew two things for certain. One, I was gonna have to ask her why not. And two, I already knew what her answer was going to be before I asked the question, but I had to ask it. So I look over at my wife looking for some kind of support. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing but a look that says, hey, smart ass, uh, this would be your area of expertise. So good luck with that. I, uh, I'm going to run and get my camera, take a few pictures. I'm going to scrapbook this precious moment. But I got nothing for you, chief. Good luck. I look back over at my daughter and I realize I have to ask the question. I ask her, why not? Why can't that be God? And in the like nanosecond before she gave me her answer, I had this weird out-of-body experience. It scared the hell out of me. I thought I was dying, actually. I was, I was like floating above the sea. I'm above the sofa and above her and me, and it's really freaky. And, um, and, and I'm having this weird sort of fantasy in that moment, right, that she's going to come up with 
some really brilliant answer, not the one I'm anticipating and that I'm sure you know what it's going to be at this point, but something brilliant like, oh, daddy, that can't be God. God's a woman, you know. Um, <laughs> or, or, or even better would have been like some existentialist answer like, God, what is God anyway? <laughs> I mean, that would have been cool, you know, but like I said, she wasn't even six, so bright kid, but not that damn bright, you know. Um, and uh, instead, she begins to give me her answer. The words begin to form on her lips. I'm sat back down into my body once again. I think I'm having a heart attack, but I look at her, and she starts to give me the answer, and she says, well, that can't be God because God isn't black. God is white. Now, here's the thing. I want you to think about this. It probably won't surprise you to learn. There are no racialized images of a deity in our house. Right? No images in our home that would give this child the impression that a deity, even if you take that deity literally as a being that has this physical appearance characteristic, that somehow that being would be the equivalent of Santa in the clouds, right? Some white dude on high giving out goodies or punishment from above. Like, we don't have any of that. We don't have any of those god-awful, pardon the pun, uh, Bible story picture books for children Right, the ones that would give you the impression, if you didn't know better, that Adam and Eve had resided in the Garden of Sweden. We don't have any of those. I mean, quite deliberately, we, we don't have those things. But yet my daughter's picking that up somewhere. She's getting that image and that impression from somewhere, not from us, not in our home, but somewhere where? Well, she's seeing those things in churches, and she's seeing them in bookstores and in libraries, and she's seeing them on the Christmas cards that friends send, you know, every holiday season that have pictures of Jesus that give you the impression that Jesus might well have been born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. You see, it comes into the house. And I want you to understand something. If you were to break into my house and try to hurt my children, I'll kill you. Right? I'll kill you. And I'm not trying to say that to be all big and bad. I'm not a violent person. I'm just, I'm also not a pacifist when it comes to defending my family. I don't have a gun, but I'll find something and I will throw it at you <laughs> and you will die that's how confident I am in the velocity with which I will hit you between the eyes with whatever the hell object I find on my nightstand and throw at you and you will die but now here's the point of me telling you that so I'm not trying to scare you into not breaking into my house I know you're not going to but but here's the point something is coming into my house and it's hurting my children and the doors are locked, and the windows are shut, and the alarm is on, and the thing that's coming in has no idea what the alarm code is to turn that off, but it's coming in quietly, and it's leaving just as quietly before I even knew it was there, and I resent it. You see, I'm not to blame for that. This isn't guilt. I didn't do that, but I have to take responsibility for it, because that's my child. And if that can happen to my child in my home, a child that's being raised in a deliberately anti-racist fashion, I assure you it can happen in any of our homes. And as long as that's true, not only for white children who then internalize superiority vis-a-vis -vis this notion of a creative energy of the universe, whether we call that God or not, but what does it say to black and brown children who see the same imagery and then they learn what? This internalized oppression, internalized inferiority, internalized notion that they are farther away from that same creative energy. That is a sickness that is going to kill at some point, the spirit, if not the body, of the people who imbibe it, you see. And so really the question we have to ask ourselves is whether or not we love ourselves enough to do something about that. This isn't about white folks trying to save black people, trying to save brown people, trying to do charity work. This isn't charity. This is serious self-help. People of color will liberate themselves from white supremacy. Bet on that. The question for us, those of us who are white, is who's going to liberate us from white supremacy because it's doing things to us that we don't even realize and it's turning us into something that we're not meant to be. We are better than that if we choose to be better than that. And I expect that we all will. I certainly hope that we will because God knows if we don't in 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, we're going to be back in this room. Not me and maybe not you per se, but other folks having the same conversation. But I promise you, by that time, the risk will be far greater. The odds of creating an equitable society will be far longer and we will be in a hell of a lot of trouble. So it isn't my job to tell you what to do and how to do it, but it is my job to say that it is important for all of us to take some time on this moment, the 50th anniversary 
of the founding of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of the premier civil rights organizations in this country's history, founded in April of 1960, a half a century ago. To take advantage of that past and that history and that example, young people, the same age as the people in this room, sometimes younger, getting together and realizing they couldn't wait for presidents to do the right thing, couldn't wait for lawmakers to do the right thing, couldn't wait for famous folks with big names to do the right thing, that they had to take history into their own hands and shape it and make it as it needed to be. And that's the challenge before you. The issues are not exactly the same. The dangers are not exactly the same. Some of the players have changed, but the problem largely remains as it always has been. And I hope that you will take the time, as those young people did 50 years ago, to make that at least part of your daily thinking about how you're going to create a different society. Because if you don't, we're all going to go down together, make no mistake, within the next two or three decades. Thank you all so much for being here tonight.